okay. <clears throat> Localizing Ashkenazic Jews to primeval villages in the ancient Iranian lands of Ashkenaz. So this is the study that preceded the, the one I read in the last video. The last one, from the, or the one from the last video, was from 2017, and this one was written in 2016. Accepted February 29th, 2016. By Ranajit Das, Paul Wexler, Mehdi Peruznia, and Iran El Haik. Abstract. The Yiddish language is over 1,000 years old and incorporates German, Slavic, and Hebrew elements. The prevalent view claims Yiddish has a German origin, whereas the opposing view posts a Slavic origin with strong Iranian and weak Turkic substrata. One of the major difficulties in deciding between these hypotheses is the unknown geographical origin of Yiddish-speaking Ashkenazic Jews. An analysis of 393 Ashkenazic, Iranian, and Mountain Jews and over 600 non-Jewish genomes demonstrated that Greeks, Romans, Iranians, and Turks exhibit the highest genetic similarity with Ashkenazic Jews. The geographic population structure analysis localized most Ashkenazic Jews along major primeval trade routes in northeastern Turkey, adjacent to primeval villages with names that may be derived from Ashkenaz. Iranian and mountain Jews were localized along trade routes on the Turkey's eastern border. Loss of maternal haplogroups was evident in non-Yiddish-speaking Ashkenazic Jews. Our results suggest that Ashkenazic Jews originated from a Slavo-Iranian confederation, which the Jews call Ashkenazic, i.e. Scythian, though these Jews probably spoke Persian and or Oset, if that's how it's pronounced. This is compatible with linguistic evidence suggesting that Yiddish is a Slavic language created by Irano-Turco-Slavic Jewish merchants along the Silk Road's as a cryptic trade language, spoken only by its originators to gain an advantage in trade. Later in the 9th century, Yiddish underwent relexification by adopting a new vocabulary that consists of a minority of German and Hebrew and a majority of newly coined Germanoid and Hebroid elements that replaced most of the original Eastern Slavic and Sorbian vocabularies while keeping the original grammars intact. <clears throat> okay, there's the abstract. Introduction. Paramount geographical movements due to voluntary migration or forced resettlement are often reflected in a language's lexicon as a new stratum of words and phrases that may replace or modify archaic terms. In an analogy to species struggle to survive, Darwin remarked that a struggle for life is constantly going on among the words and grammatical forms in each language. This parallelism between the history of a language and its speakers and the expectation that such insights will highlight the geographical origins of populations have attracted much attention from geneticists and linguists. Major deviations from this parallelism are explicable by admixture or migration, followed by extreme isolation. In such cases, the language's lexicon may represent various strata of words from different languages the migrating people have encountered, deeming most phylogenetic-based approaches inapp inapplicable. For that reason, it has been proposed to look at linguistic and genetic data in parallel and attempt integrative analyses. One of the last European languages whose linguistic and geographical classifications remain unclear even after three centuries of research is Slavic Yiddish, the native language of the Ashkenazic Jewish community, whose own origins is still under debate. The Slavic Yiddish, now called universally simply Yiddish, spoken since the 9th century, consists of Hebrew, German, Slavic, and other elements written in Aramaic characters. Because of its many radical deviations from native German norms, its alleged cognate language, Yiddish has been rudely labeled both by native and non-native speakers as bad German, and in Slavic languages as a jargon. Part of the problem in deciphering its origin is that over the centuries Yiddish speakers have invented a huge number of Germanoid or German-like and Hebroid 
components coined by non-native speakers of those languages based on Slavic or Iranian models alongside authentic Semitic Hebrew and German components. An example of an invented phrase is modern Hebrew paxot o joter, or yoter, literally less or more. That imitates the same written Ashkenazic Hebroid phrase derived from Upper Sorbian and Iranian languages, but not Old Semitic Hebrew. The overwhelming majority of the world's languages use more or less. This expression appeared during the Middle Ages long after the death of spoken Hebrew and possibly a millennium before the appearance of modern-day modern Hebrew or Israeli Hebrew. These and other invented features made the components of Yiddish word strata and their relationship to other languages multi-layered, porous, and fugacious and difficult to, to localize. The work of Cavalli, Sforza, and other investigators have already established the strong relationship between geography, genetics, and languages, implying that the geographical origin of Yiddish would correspond to that of Yiddish speakers. However, the genomes of Yiddish speakers were never studied, and the admixture, admixed nature of both Yiddish and Ashkenazic Jewish genome approaches, sorry, preclude using traditional approaches to localize their geographical origins. It is also unclear whether Ashkenazic Jews subgroups share common origins. To improve our understanding about the geographical and ancestral origins of contemporary Ashkenazic Jews, genome-wide and haplogroup analyses and comparison with Jewish and non-Jewish populations were performed. Our findings are evaluated in light of two major linguistic hypotheses depicting a German or Turkic or Khazar, <coughs> Ukrainian and Sorbian in the Eastern German lands, geographical origins for Yiddish and Ashkenazic Jews. Okay. The Rhineland hypothesis envisions modern Yiddish-speaking Ashkenazic Jews to be the descendants of the ancient Judeans. The presence of Jews in Western and later Eastern Europe is explained in an oversimplified manner by two allegedly mass migratory waves, first from the ancient Israel to Roman Empire, then later from what is now Germany to Slavic lands. The theory posits the Roman exile that followed the destruction of Herod's temple in 70 AD as introducing a massive Jewish population to Roman lands. Yiddish is assumed to have developed in the 9th century to 10th century when Romance-speaking French and Italian Jews migrated to the Rhineland and Franconia and replaced their Romance speech with local German dialects. The absence of local Rhineland German dialect features in Yiddish subsequently prompted linguists to relocate its birthplace <clears throat> to Bavaria. It was these Jews who created the so-called Ashkenazic culture, named after the medieval Hebrew term for German lands. Again, this is all the Rhineland theory he's describing. This is the theory he's opposing. The second migration wave took place in the 13th century when German Jews allegedly migrated into monolingual Slavic lands and rapidly reproduced via a demographic miracle. The competing Irano-Turco-Slavic hypothesis considers Ashkenazic Jews to be the descendants of a heterogeneous Iranian population, which later mixed with Eastern and Western Slavs, and possibly some Turks and Greeks in the, in the territory of the Khazar Empire around the 8th century AD. The name Ashkenaz is the biblical Hebrew adaption of the Iranian tribal name, which was rendered in Assyrian and Babylonian documents of the 7th century BC as Ashkuza, called in the English by the Greek, Greek, Greek equivalent Scythian. Already by the 1st century, most of the Jews in the world resided in the Iranian Empire. These Jews were descended either from Judean immigrants or more likely from local converts to Judaism and were extremely active in international trade as evident from the Talmud and non-Jewish historical sources. Over time, many of them moved north to the Khazar Empire to expand their mercantile operations. Qu consequently, 
some of the Turkic Khazar rulers and the numerous Eastern Slavs in the Khazar Empire converted to Judaism to participate in the lucrative silk trade, silk road trade between Germany and China, which was essentially a Jewish monopoly. Uh, sources for that are Rabinowitz, 45 and 48, and Barron, 1957. Those are old sources, but... <clears throat> Uh, Yiddish emerged at that time as a secret language for trade based on Slavic and even Iranian patterns of discourse. When these Jews began settling in Western and Eastern Slavic lands, Yiddish went through a relexification process, that is, replacing the Eastern Slavic and the newly acquired Sorbian vocabularies with a German vocabulary while keeping the original grammar and sound system intact. Critics of this hypothesis cite the fragmentary and incomplete historical records from the first millennium and discount the relevance of relaxification to Yiddish studies. Assuming the history of Yiddish and Ashkenazic Jews is parallel, at least in part, localizing the genomic admixture signature of Yiddish and non-Yiddish speaking Ashkenazic Jews may also unveil the birthplaces of Yiddish and Ashkenazic Jews, respectively, Due to the changes in the population structure of Ashkenazic Jews over the past millennia, we do not expect our biogeographical predictions to perfectly agree with the predictions made by either hypothesis. This is the first study that analyzes genetic data of Yiddish speakers and is carried out at a most timely manner, as individuals who speak solely Yiddish sorry, are increasingly difficult to find. So, we have uh, a, a table here to read two hypotheses regarding the origin of Yiddish language and lexicography. So, you have the Rhineland hypothesis, uh, which gives the Yiddish language a lexicographical admixture of 80% German, 15% Hebrew, and 5% Slavic. It purports that the origins of it are in southwestern and southeastern Germany known as Rhineland and Bavaria, respectively. Now, the other hypothesis, the irano turco slavic says that the lexicographical admixture of Yiddish is 43% Slavic, 35% German, 8% Hebrew, and the remaining 14 is an Iranian, Turkic, and unique Romance Arabic, including Berberized Arabic and Greek. Uh, the origins purported are, one, the Khazar's empire, two, the Kievan Rus, or today Ukraine, and three, the Sorbian areas of Germany. The Rhineland hypothesis differs from the irano turco slavic hypothesis by ignoring the Iranian component alongside the Hebroidisms and Germano Germanoidisms whose geographical origins are unclear. Both hypotheses, however, agree on the same three basic components— German, Slavic, and Hebrew, though they disagree on the proportions. On to results. We analyzed the genomes of 367 public participants of the Gen Genographic Project who reported having Ashkenazic Jewish parents. They were further subdivided to 186 descendants of sole Yiddish speakers, and 181 descendants of multilingual or non-Yiddish speakers. Country of residence was reported by 94% Yiddish and non-Yiddish speakers, with the vast majority of all individuals living in the United States. We note that these figures do not correspond to the geographic distribution of Yiddish speakers. This is all referring to Table 2, so let me open that up. Okay, so that's going to be down here. We're going to go past that table. I see. So this is the residency of the Ashkenazic Jews in the study. And you see most, most live in the United States. We note that these figures do not correspond to the geographic distribution of Yiddish speakers and overrepresent the share of Americans mainly at the expense of ultra-Orthodox Jews, one of the largest group of Yiddish speakers. However, since the parents of all individuals studied here are Europeans, the sample bias probably reflects choices of contemporary residency 
rather than ancestral origins and is unlikely to have a large effect on our results. All biogeographical inferences were carried out using the geographic population structure tool. In brief, GPS infers the geographical coordinates of an individual by matching its admixture proportions with those of reference populations known to reside in a certain geographical region for a substantial period of time. Whereas a population's movement followed by gene exchanges with other populations modifies its admixture signature, isolation and segregation preserve the original admixture signature of the migratory population. GPS predictions should therefore be interpreted as the last place that admixture has occurred, termed here geographical origin. For an individual of mixed origins, the inferred coordinates represent the mean geographical locations of their immediate ancestors. Our search for the geographical origins of Ashkenazic Jews was focused on Eurasia, with particular consideration of the area covering the regions predicted by each hypothesis. This area encompasses German lands, South Russia, and the area between ancient Judea and the western regions of the former Iranian or Sasanian Empire. With the exception of a pre-Scythian Iron Age individual included in our analyses, the absence of sufficient ancient DNA from the relevant time period required using modern-day populations as substitutes may restrict our ability to ascertain all the founding populations of Ashkenazic Jews. <coughs> Continuing, Biogeographical Mapping of Afro-Eurasian Populations Prior to applying GPS to elucidate the geographical origins of Ashkenazic Jews, we sought to evaluate its accuracy on Afro-Eurasian populations. For that, we analyzed the genomes of over 600 individuals belonging to 35 populations and, es and estimated their admixture proportion in respect to nine admixture components corresponding to putative ancestral populations. So this is figure 2A we're talking about here. So here's the different uh, groups. Uh, we have down here, if you can't read it, uh, Egyptians, Bedouins and Palestinians, Lebanese, Armenians, Iranians, Iranian Jews, Mountain Jews, uh, and just a bunch of other ethnic groups going all the way to Japanese and Chinese and Mongolian on the end here. This big chunk in the middle is Ashkenazic Jews. And you can see the different uh, proportions of admixture. So green represents Northern European. Uh, red down here represents Sub-Saharan African. Pink, Mediterranean. That might actually be Southwest Asian. And uh, the brown here, Northeast Asian. So you can see different admixtures for different people. Uh, they're, they're kind of ordered by similarity. So you can see Ashkenazic Jews are most similar to the groups next to them here, the Turks and Kurd, the Turks, and on the other side, Bulgarians. Very good. All the genomes consist of at least four admixture components and segregate within and among neighboring populations. In Western Eurasians, Mediterranean, Southwest Asian, and Northern European are the most dominant admixture components, with the latter nearly replacing the sub-Saharan component. Genetic diversity was estimated by computing the genetic distances defined as the minimal Euclidean distances between the admixture proportions of each individual and all members of a population of interest. Small genetic distances indicate high genetic similarity. The median genetic distances in all populations are small, suggesting high within population homogene homogeneity. We apply GPS using the leave one out procedure at the population level. Assignment accuracy was determined for each individual based on whether the predicted geographical coordinates were within 500 or 250 kilometers from the political boundaries of the individual's country or regional locations. 
GPS correctly assigned 83% and 78% of the individuals within less than 500 and 250 kilometers from their countries, respectively. The low prediction accuracy for some populations, like Chinese, can be explained by the low density of reference populations in their areas or high genetic heterogeneity, uh, like Altian, Altians. I can't pronounce that. Within the area covered by the two linguistic hypotheses and harbored by 554 individuals belonging to 31 populations, the accuracy was 2% higher. As expected, the prediction accuracy within the, that area was even higher. 97 to 94% of the individuals were assigned within less than 500 and 250 kilometers of their countries, respectively, for speakers of geographically localized languages like... Abkhazians, Armenians, Bulgarians, Danes, Finns, Jordans, Greeks, Romanians, Germans, and Palestinians, which also include some of the putative basal components of Yiddish. These results illustrate the tight relationship between genome, geography, and language and delineate the expected assignment accuracy for Yiddish speakers. Good. So... We can go here and look at this table. So this table, we'll read the, uh, what's underneath. An illustrated timeline for events comprised by the Lineland, Rhineland hypothesis and the Irano-Turco-Slavic hypothesis. The stages of Yiddish evolution, according to each hypothesis, are shown through landmark events for which the identity of the proto-Ashkenazic Jewish populations and their spoken languages are noted per region. Let's take a look. So starting here around uh, 0 AD, we start with Judea and the Judeans who speak uh, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And then it splits into the two hypotheses. So the left, the blue, is the Rhineland hypothesis, which they're uh, competing with, essentially. And the orange is the hypothesis they're trying to support with this research. The uh, Khazarian, essentially, hypothesis. So let's start with the, the mainstream hypothesis that they're battling against here. It starts in 70 AD with a Roman exile, which uh, was explained in the last video, has little historical evidence. But because of that, the Jews moved to Italy, or the Judeans, sorry, moved to Italy. They speak Romance languages or a Judeo-Romance language. Around this time, they migrate into Franconia, so now we have Judeans in France. Again, sp speaking Romance languages or Judeo-Romance languages. These, both these groups, uh, over about 400 years, migrate into Germany. Uh, they become Judeans in Germany. They speak a German dialect uh, or a Judeo-Romance language. Uh, they move to f speak a, f a form of High German, over a few more hundred years, mid-13th century mass migration to Eastern Europe. So then they become Judeans in Eastern Europe, speaking Slavic and pre-Yiddish languages. Then in this time period, a large expansion in the Ashkenazic population due to a demographic miracle, basically rapid reproduction at rates unlike their neighbors or at previous times. And then the de-Germanization of Yiddish towards Slavic makes the Ashkenazic Jews of Europe who speak Yiddish. Now let's go to the Slavo-Iranic, Slavic-Iranic hypothesis, or the Khazar hypothesis, which they're saying is more likely. So we start with the Judeans in Judea, and then there's an introduction of Iranians who become Judaized. In 586 BC, there's a Babylonian exile and migrations to Iran, so we get Iranian Jews who speak Iranian languages and Eastern Aramaic. So now over the next 700 years or so, they start mixing with Slavic peoples. And then there's the historically uh, supported Juda Judaization of the Khazar elite in the 8th century. All this leads to, in Khazaria, Juda Judaized Slavs, Turkic Khazars, and Iranians and Mongolians all speaking a Slavic 
pre-Yiddish language. Then two things happen. First, the collapse of Khazari in the 10th to 13th centuries, which caused westward, westward migration of these peoples. And in the 9th century, uh, Iranian traders arriving in Germany, converting. So now we have Sorbian converts in Germany speaking Upper Sorbian and pre-Yiddish languages. And we have Ashkenazic Jews in Eastern Europe speaking what's essentially Yiddish. These two groups together uh, have a 15th century migration into Western Europe. And here we get the fully European Ashkenazic Jews speaking Yiddish. So it's kind of just a historical outline of the two competing hypotheses. Good. Okay. Biographical m mapping of Eurasian Jews. Like most Eurasians, Yiddish speaker genomes are a medley of three major components, Mediterranean, Southwest Asian, and Northern European, although like the ancient pre-Scythian, they also exhibit a small and consistent sub-Saharan African component, less than two, about 2%, sorry. In general agreement with Morjani et al. To, from 2011, that's the end of the sentence. Okay, GPS positioned nearly all Ashkenazic Jews on the southern coast of the Black Sea in northeastern Turkey, adjacent to the southern border of ancient Khazaria. There we located four primeval villages that bear names that may derive from Ashkenaz. Uh, Ishkenaz or Eshkenaz <coughs> in the province of Trabzon, Eshkenaz, at the uh, and in the province of Erzurum, Ashanaz, today Ujinjili. Excuse my pronunci pronunciation of the uh, Turkish there. In the province of Baybert and Ashuz, in the province of Tunseli, all of which are in close proximity to major trade routes, the Turkish toponyms or ethnonyms are very suggestive of a Jewish trading presence, but given the poor state of Turkish toponymic studies, we cannot say for sure. There are no other place names anywhere in the world derived from this ethnonym. Instead, to the best of our knowledge, the many Jewish way stations on the trade routes throughout Afro-Eurasia are named after the root Jew, but these may be places named by non-Jews. Ashkenazic Jews were localized within 211 kilometers from at least one such village. Similar results were obtained with Turks, excluded from the reference panel indicating the robustness of our approach. No individual was positioned in Germany or proximate to the ancient pre-Scythian individual who was localized to Ukraine, about 500 kilometers from a place I can't pronounce in Hungary where it was originally found. A comparison of the genetic distances between Ashkenazic Jews and the reference populations confirmed that Ashkenazic Jews are significantly closer to Turks, Armenians, and Romanians than to other populations. The genetic distance to Germans was slightly higher than to, pre to the pre-Scythian individual. Similar results were found for other Jewish communities and Ashkenazic Jewish subgroups. Iranian Jews were positioned about 200 kilometers east of Eshkenaz, close to Tabriz, where a large Jewish community existed during the first millennium. The mountain Jews nested with and between both Jewish communities, forming a geogenetic continuum. The admixture and GPS results for Yiddish and non-Yiddish speakers were very similar. On average, these two cohorts have the same admixture components, and their geographical origins follow similar trends. That all Ashkenazic Jews were predicted away from their parental birth countries implies arrival by migration and limited gene exchange with Western and Central European populations. Haplogroup analysis of Ashkenazic Jews. For Ashkenazic Jews, the most common uh, Low-resolution mtDNA haplogroups explain less of the variation compared to the Y haplogroups. More specifically, the most common mtDNA haplogroups, uh, K1A, H1, N1, J1, HV, and K2A, 
are present in 65% of the individuals compared with 74% of the individual individuals that belong to the most common Y haplogroups, J1A, E1B, J2A, R1A, and R1B. The top six most common high-resolution mtDNA and Y uh, haplogroups are present in about a third of the samples. We observed major dissimilarities in the number of unique Y chromosomal and mtDNA haplogroups between Yiddish and non-Yiddish speakers who exhibit lower haplogroup diversity, uh, sorry, who exhibit lower haplogroup diversity. Yiddish speakers belong to maternal lineages like H7, I, T2, and V alongside the paternal Q1B are all are rare or absent in non-Yiddish speakers. Nearly all common high-resolution haplogroups appear more frequently in Jews than non-Jews, though none are unique to Ashkenazic Jews or Jews in general, and three of them are infrequent in Ashkenazic Jews compared with other groups. There's supplement supplementary material for all this. The most common Y haplogroups dominate the area between the, blacks, the Black and Caspian Seas and represent the major lineages among populations inhabiting Western Asian regions, including Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, and the Caucasus. <clears throat> In contrast, the mtDNA haplogroups indicate a more diffused origin and include haplogroups common in Africa, Near East, Europe, North Asia, Northwest Eurasia, Northwest Asia, and Northeast Eurasia. High genetic diversity was also observed in the Y and mtDNA haplogroups of priestly lineage claimants. Those are people who claim to be uh, descended from the, police, the priest classes of the ancient Hebrews, uh, the Kohanes. Uh, let's take a step back to these tables. I'm not going to bother with this one. Figure two depicts the distributions of nine admixture components. Okay. I'm going to go past that. Okay, continuing. The geographical and ancestral origins of Ashkenazic Jews. Just going to take a peek ahead here, what we're looking at. GPS findings raise two concerns. First, that the Turkish Ashkenaz region, region may be the centric location of other regions rather than the place where the Ashkenazic Jewish admixture signature was formed. Second, in the absence of Ashkenazic Turks, it is impossible to compare the genetic similarity between the two populations to validate the common origins implied by the GPS results. To surmount these problems, we derive the admixture signatures of native populations corresponding to the geographic coordinates of interest from the global distributions of admixture components and compared their genetic distances with Ashkenazic Jews. This approach has several advantages. First, it allows studying native populations that were not sampled. Second, it allows identifying putative progenitors by, by comparing genetic distances between different populations. Third, it minimizes the effect of outliers in modern-day populations. Finally, it circumvents, to a certain degree, the problem of comparing Ashkenazic Jews with modern-day populations that may have experienced various levels of gene, gene exchange or genetic drift past their mixture with Ashkenazic Jews. Let's just see this table here, another one, figure four. This is about haplogroups. Good. I encourage everybody to investigate this stuff for themselves. Again, it can be find, found through Iran El Haik's webpage, iranelhaiklab.org. He also has a YouTube channel. Okay. We generated the admixture signatures of 100 or 200 native individuals from six areas associated with the origin of Yiddish and Ashkenazic Jews. Germany, Ukraine, Khazaria, Turkish, Ashkenaz, Israel, and Iran. 
we first tested the genetic affinity of these native populations by examining their genetic distances to modern-day populations residing within the same regions. For Israelites, we used Palestinians and Bedouins, and for Khazars, we used Armenians, Georgians, Abkhazians, Chechens, and Ukrainians. The average distance between the native and modern-day populations was four slightly higher than within modern-day populations, with Khazarian and Iranian showing the highest heterogeneity. Consequently, GPS mapped most of the native individuals to their correct geographical origins, with the exception of the Khazars and Iranians, likely due to the shared historical, geographical, and genetic backgrounds of Iranians, Turks, and southern Caucasus populations. Caucasus populations. The Ashkenazic Jews predicted in our earlier analysis largely overlapped with the native Ashkenazic Turk and a few Khazarian and Iranian individuals mapped to northeastern Turkey. A comparison of distance between Ashkenazic Jews and native populations confirmed that Yiddish speakers are significantly closer to each other, followed by native Khazars, Ashkenazic Turks, Iranians, Israelites, Germans, and Ukrainians. Similar results were obtained for Yiddish and non-Yiddish Yiddish speakers, whereas most Ashkenazic Jews are geographically closest to native Khazars, followed by Iranian and Ashkenazic Turks, priestly lineage claimants are closest to native Ashkenazic Turks. To identify additional potential founding populations, we assessed the genetic distances between Ashkenazic Jews and all non-Jewish individuals in this study, including populations excluded from the reference population panel. Most of the individuals cluster along an A-shaped structure with the ends corresponding to Scandinavians and North Africans. Ashkenazic Jews, due to their large number, formed the apex of the A connecting Southern Europeans with Near Eastern, with Near Eastern. Ashkenazic Jews overlapped with few Greeks and Italians with an Irano-Turkish supercluster. <clears throat> the relative dearth of individuals related to both Ashkenazic Jews and Near Eastern populations can be explained in several ways. First, key founding populations are either missing from our study, are highly heterogeneous, and underrepresented in our study, like Iranians, or have disappeared over time through demographic processes. This hypothesis can be addressed in future studies with additional samples from this region. Second, the loss of millions of Eastern and Western European Jews during the mid-20th century may account for the observed gap. Though this hypothesis cannot be formally tested, we note that, the, that six Ashkenazic Jews of German descent cluster at the center of the Ashkenazic Jewish distribution or north of it, whereas six other Ashkenazic Jews positioned at the south and east edges of that distribution were of Eastern European descent. Third, Ashkenazic Jewish genomes may be conglomerates of Greco-Roman, turco irano slavic and perhaps Judean genomes, formed through ongoing proselytization events that continued undisturbed for many centuries in Turkish Ashkenaz. These events were localized to the extent that no single Ashkenazic non-Jewish population presently exists. However, the few Greek, Italian, Bulgarians, and Iranian individuals clustered with or adjacent to Ashkenazic Jews imply that individuals descent from the potential progenitors of Ashkenazic Jews still exhibit similar genetic makeup to Ashkenazic Jews and may even be at risk for the genetic disorders prevalent in this population. Confirming this hypothesis will shed new light on the origin of mutations associated with genetic disorders like cystic fibrosis and thalassemia and promote genetic screening for all at-risk individuals. Identifying the founding populations and their relative contribution to the Ashkenazic Jewish genome necess necessitate using biogeographical bio tools that can discern multiple origins, but such an analysis is beyond the scope of this article. Every language is the creative product of community and a co-creator of behavior and values, but Yiddish has experienced especially extreme peregrinations as the millennia-old 
vernacular of Ashkenazic Jews. The questions of Yiddish and Ashkenazic Jewish origins have, become, have been some of the most debatable questions in history, linguistics, and genetics over the past 300 years. While Yiddish is clearly a blend of at least three languages, German, Slavic, and Hebrew, the exact proportions and consequently its geographical origin remain unsettled. Emphasized the truism that the yeah, emphasize the truism that the history of Yiddish mirrors the history of its speakers, which prompted us to reconstruct the geographical and ancestral origins of Yiddish and non-Yiddish speaking Ashkenazic Jewish genomes. These analyses reveal the birthplaces of Yiddish and Ashkenazic Jews. Evaluating the evidence for geographical origin of Ashkenazic Jews. Regardless of linguistic orientation, descendants of Ashkenazic Jewish parents comprise mostly a homogenous group in terms of genetic admixture and geographic origins. Intriguingly, GPS positioned nearly all Ashkenazic Jews in the vicinity of the ancient Scythian inhabited territory in close proximity to four primeval villages, Ishkenaz, Eshkenaz, Ashkenaz, and Ashuz, that may derive their names from Ashkenaz. Historically, the area where these villages were found was in the Greek kingdom of Pontus, established by Greek settlers in the early first millennium who took active part in maritime trade. Prior and sporadically through, through the early 10th century, that area was a center of Byzantine commercial and coastal trade inhabited by a Jewish community. We surmise that the admixture signature of Ashkenazic Jewish genomes was formed in this major tra transcontinental hub connecting East Asian, West European, and North Eurasian roads. Most of the Ashkenazic Jews were localized between Trabzon and Amasis, today Samson, found about 300 kilometers west of Trabzon, where a widespread Jewish settlement existed during the early centuries AD. Primeval Iraqi Jewish communities proliferated by 600 AD, like Sarari, Nisbis, today Nusaibin, and Argiza, could be found about 300 kilometers south to the Babert province. Remarkably, our findings echo Harkavis, who wrote in 1867 that the first Jews who came to the southern reg regions of Russia did not originate in Ashkenaz, as he meant Germany, as many writers tend to believe, but from the Greek cities on the shores of the Black Sea and from Asia via the mountains of the Caucasus. And those of anthropo anthropologist Weissenberg uh, in 1994. Our findings also support Rabinowitz's thesis that European Jewish communities often nested along the continental trade routes, which determine their preferred residency. Rabinowitz argued in favor of an unbroken chain of Jewish communities from the west to the far east upon which Jews, and particularly the Radonites, could rely for their travels. Thus, far only few studies attempted to trace the geographical origins of Ashkenazic Jews. Our results are in general agreement with two small-scale studies. The first positioned 20... Sorry, where are we? <clears throat> positioned 20 Eastern European Jews south of the Black Sea, about 100 kilometers away from the province of Tunseli. The second reported an Eastern Turkish origin for 29 Ashkenazic Jews, about 630 kilometers west of the mean geographical coordinates obtained here. Okay, evaluating the evidence for the ancestral origins of Ashkenazic Jews. Although our biogeographical results are well localized, the exact identity of Ashkenazic Jewish progenitors remains nebulous. The term Ashkenaz is already a tantalizing clue to the large Iranian origin group that inhabited the central Eurasian steppes, though it cannot be considered evidence of a Scythian origin due to the lack of records about Scythian culture and the obsolescence of Scythian language about 500 years prior to the appearance of Yiddish. It is more likely that Ashkenazic Jews called themselves Scythians because this was a popular name in the Bible and in the Caucasus Ukraine area even long after the disappearance of the Scythians. Ashkenazic Jews may have been considered themselves related may have even considered themselves related to the Scythians based on a shared Irano-Turkish origin, as evident from the proximity of Yiddish speakers to Iranian Jews positioned close to Iran. However, they probably were not Scythians. 
Irano-Turkish Jews were speakers of Persian, Oset, and other forms of Iranian, which became extinct during the 10th century. This conclusion is further co corroborated by the large geographical distance between the predicted origins of Ashkenazic Jews and the ancient pre-Scythian. The inheritance of patterns of the mtDNA chromosomes are directly related to the question of Ashkenazic Jewish origins. Re uh, Costa et al. in 2013 reported that four major founding mtDNA line lineages account for about 40% of mtDNA variation in Ashkenazic Jews. These haplogroups were among the six most common haplogroups in our analyses and accounted for 37.6% and 39.5% of the mtDNA variation among Yiddish and non-Yiddish speakers, respectively. Costa et al. reasoned that Judaized women made major contributions to the formation of Ashkenazic communities. This conclusion is in agreement with a widespread Judaization of slaves and depictions of Greco-Roman women leading communities of pros proselytes and adherence to Judaism during the first millennium AD. Another clue to the diverse background of Ashkenazic Jewish progenitors is the limited haplogroup diversity among non-Yiddish speakers that may indicate the loss of rare haplogroups, probably through genetic drift since they are uncommon in Europe. For example, the Northern Asiatic Q1B1A Y haplogroup one of the most common haplogroups among Yiddish speakers, 3.7%, uh, is completely absent among non-Yiddish speakers. Uh, Far Eastern maternal haplogroups found in Ashkenazic Jews were recently reported by, the, by Tian et al. in 2015. The mitochondrial haplogroup L2A1 is found in five Ashkenazic maternal lineages where 80% of the mothers speak solely Yiddish. A search in the genographic public data set found 229 individuals with that haplogroup. Of those, 169 described their maternal descent as African, European, or Jewish, mostly Ashkenazic. One of the most fascinating questions in genetics is the origin of individuals whose surnames hint of an association with biblical priesthood lineages. The haplogroup diversity of the five priestly lineage claimants positioned close to simulated Ashkenazic Turks suggests that they have originated from shamans who adopted the surname in support of historical descriptions of Jews establishing a proselytization center in Ashkenaz lands where they have anointed Levites and Kohens to Judaize their slaves and neighboring populations. Interestingly, Brooke, 2014, reported a Crimean Karite man with a surname of Kogan who self-identifies as a Kohen and belongs to a J1Y haplogroup. This panel of 12 short tandem repeats on that chromosomal but not a panel of 25 STRs matched exactly a Belarusian Ashkenazic Kohen whose surname is Kagan or Kahan. We surmise that some Cohen surnames are later modifications of Kagan, the term used by the Turks and Khazars to denote a leader. Huh. This hypothesis may explain the difficulties in establishing genetic markers associated with priesthood. Despite the assiduous and indefatigable indef efforts to do so. Hmm. I don't know what that word means. In the era of ancient DNA sequencing, the peculiar absence of priestly or even Judean ancient DNA should render any assertions or insinuations that certain genetic markers are telltales of Judean lineage lineages or biblical fig figures as fictitious. Our autosomal analyses highlight the high genetic similarity between Ashkenazic Jews and Iranians, Turks, Southern Caucasians, Greeks, Italians, and Slavs. Altogether, our results portray a millennium-old melting pot process in the focal region of Turkish Ashkenaz that crystallized these and other putative progenitors into an Ashkenazic Jewish community in agreement with the first prediction of the irano turko slavic hypothesis. Our findings further imply that the migration of Ashkenazic Jews to Europe was followed by social isolation and avoidance of intermarriages, which largely retained their unique admixture, admixture signature. 
although we cannot rule out the possibility of a limited gene exchange and religious conversions. Nonetheless, socio-religious practices compounded with a unique language seems to be more effective means of genetic isolation than geographical barriers. Our findings are also consistent with the vast majority of genetic findings that Ashkenazic Jews are, close, are closer to Near Eastern, i.e. Turks, Iranians, and Kurds, and South European populations like Greeks and Italians, as opposed to Middle Eastern populations like Bedouins and Palestinians. Remarkably, with only few exceptions, these findings have been consistently misinterpreted in favor of a Middle Eastern Judean ancestry, although the data do not support such contention for either Y-chromosomal or genome-wide studies. To promulgate a Middle Eastern origin despite the findings, various dispositions were adopted. Some authors consolidated the Middle East with other regions, whereas other authors abolished it altogether. For example, Selden et al. 20, 2006 wrote that the Southern European component is consistent with a later Mediterranean origin, whereas Root, Rootsi et al. in 2013 declared it as part of the Near East, which is the geographic location for the ancient Hebrews, according to that study, and apparently Ashkenazic Levites. A common fallacy is interpreting the genetic similarity between Ashkenazic Jews as evidence of a Middle Eastern origin. For example, Kopelman et al., 20, uh, 2009, advised caution when considering the similarity between Ashkenazic Jews with Adigai and Sardinians, and since Jewish communities cluster together, they, quote, share a common Middle Eastern ancestry. Tian et al., 2009, dis uh, dismissed similar findings for Ashkenazic Jews, denouncing them as the only population that appears to have a unique genotypic pattern that may not reflect geographic origins. <laughs> a newly emerging trend is partial Middle Easternization. For example, traced Ashkenazic Jews to Eastern Turkey, sorry, uh, sorry, Behar et al. in 2013, traced Ashkenazic Jews to Eastern Turkey, but argued in favor of a shared Middle Eastern and European ancestries based on the shared ancient Middle Eastern origin common to most Near Eastern populations. This approach assumes undisturbed genetic continu continuity of Ashkenazic Jews since the Neolithic era, along with the existence of a Middle Eastern ancestral component. Both are unsupported by the data. In fact, all Western and Central Eurasians share similar admixture components, and Middle Easternizing, Easternalizing is uninformative to study recent origin, particularly when applied selectively to populations who exhibit similarity to Ashkenazic Jews. Similarly, Atzmon et al., uh, 2010, have reported that Northern Italians show the greatest proximity to Ashkenazic Jews, followed by Sardinians and French, in support of non-Semitic Mediterranean ancestry, but the coloring patterns of their admixture plot, which are similar to our figure 2a, persuaded them that Ashkenazic Jews have, quote, demonstrated a Middle Eastern ancestry. Most innovatively, the authors have then interpreted, interpreted the differential patterns of genetic segments that are identical by descent in Ashkenazic Jews as consistent with a bottleneck paradigm, citing a demographic miracle to support this claim. To the best of our knowledge, no large-scale study has reported that Ashkenazic Jews are genetically closer to German or Israelite populations compared with Near Eastern and Southern European populations. Bedouins and Palestinians are the only populations localized to Israel. Evaluating the evidence for the Rhineland Hypothesis. Let's see. The Rhineland Hypothesis is unsupported by our analyses and suffers from several weaknesses. First, it relies on an unsubstantiated event purported to explain how Judeans arrived in Eastern Europe uh, from Judea or Roman Palestine. Second, it consists of major migrations from Germany to Poland that did not take place. Third, it dismisses the contribution of proselytes by assuming a demographic miracle that inflated only the Jewish population size in Eastern Europe from 50,000 in the 15th century 
to 5 million in the 19th century. Already criticized by several authors, ironically, mysticism and superstitions and other supernatural elements have likely been introduced to Ashkenazic Jews by Judaized pagans. Fourth, it ignores the small size of the Jewish population in the Middle Ages Germany that was on the order of hundreds or thousands, which makes them unlikely to exact a strong cultural influence on the numerous irano turco slavic Ashkenazic Jews, or meaningful genetic contribution, as is evident by the irano turco slavic admixture signature of Ashkenazic Jews. This genetic contribution has already been reported in epidemiological studies, for example, studying rare skin disorders, Mobini et al., 1997, reported that Ashkenazic Jews and Northwest Iranian non-Jews carry the same major histocompatibility complex haplotypes for Pemphigus vulgaris. The authors surmised that this gene arose before the separation of the two populations. Crucially, much of the German component that buttresses the Rhineland hypothesis are actually Germanoid elements that deviate from native German norms and were invented by Yiddish speakers, mainly based on Slavic and, to a lesser extent, on Iranian models. It's also unclear why Semitic Hebrew, which had been dead for nearly a millennium, would be revived in the 9th century. Some of the confusion contributing to the establishment of this hypothesis stems from the erroneous association of the term Ashkenaz with the German lands, Germans, uh, both Jewish and non-Jewish. In the late 11th century, contemporaneous with the rise of Yiddish, Ashkenazic began with the meaning of Scythian. In the 10th century in Baghdad, it meant Slavic, and by the early 1100s in Europe, it assumes the meaning of German slash Yiddish and later the German non-Jews and the German lands. In the 10th century, a Moroccan Karite philologist knew that the Ashkenazic people descended from the Khazars and Germans, meaning that they came from the Khazar Empire and spoke Yiddish. The author of a Hebrew-Persian dictionary from Urgench, present-day Uzbekistan, in the early 14th century, called his native land Ashkenaz. In the early 20th century, Caucasian Jews were still known by their les lesbian neighbors as Ashkenazic. The surname Ashkenazic was also occasionally found among the Crimean Krimchaks. Okay, <clears throat> reconstructing the origin of Ashkenazic Jews and Yiddish. The most parsimonious explanation for our findings is that Yiddish-speaking Ashkenazic Jews have originated from Greco-Roman and mixed irano turco slavic populations who espoused Judaism in a variety of venues throughout the first millennium AD in Ashkenaz lands, centered between the Black and Caspian Seas. These pagans became God-fearers, aka non-Jewish supporters of Second Temple Judaism, probably around the 1st century AD, after encountering Irano-Turkish Jews and have accepted the doctrine of Judaism to the extent that they created at least two translations of the Bible into Greek during the 1st and 2nd centuries. They were, also experienced, they were also experienced maritime merchants who may have considered the mutual advantages in forming an alliance with the Irano-Turkish Jews. Again, that's Silk Road trading advantages. At the height of the Khazar Empire in the 8th and 9th centuries, Hebrew as a native language had been dead for five to six centuries. In the empire, Slavic and Iranian had become major lingua francas. At this time, Iranian Jews had brought to the Khazar Empire an Iranianized Judaism together with the Talmud, as well as written Talmudic Aramaic Biblical Hebrew, written Hebrewid, and spoken Eastern Aramaic and Iranian. The Khazars converted to Judaism to profit from the transit trade across the territories, their territories. They appear not to have participated very much as merchants abroad. The Judaization of the Khazar elite and the presence of the international Jewish merchants plying the international silk roads between China, the Islamic world, and Europe prompted the irano turco slavic Jewish merchants to create Yiddish for use in Europe, uh, Loturai, a cryptic language first cited in the 10th century, Azerbaijan, and surviving to the present day for use in Iran, 
and the many variants of cryptic Hebrew and Hebroid lexicon for use of Jewish merchants throughout Afro-Eurasia. This is evident in both genetic and linguistic evidence by the ge biogeographical proximity of Yiddish speakers to Iranian, Iranian Jews, and Turks, and the existence of over 250 terms, meaning buying and selling, in Yiddish, most of which were Hebroidisms, Germanoidisms, and Slavisms, with only a handful of authentic German terms. The existence of Jewish communities along major trade routes who share religion, common irano turco slavic culture and history, and a secret language created a political and spiritual unity and maintained a Jewish trading advantage. We note that while Hebrew could serve as the basis of the international cryptic trade lexicon, it could not serve as a full-fledged language since no Jew could speak the language by that time. In the 9th century, a Persian postal official in the Baghdad Caliphate, Ibn Khoradabe, described the Iranian Jewish traders, who by then may have already become a tribal confederation of Slavic, Iranian, and Turkic converts to Judaism, as conversant in the main components of Yiddish, Slavic, German, Iranian, Hebrew, in addition to several other languages. The total number of languages given was six, but some of his language names were most likely abbreviations of sets of languages, for example, Andalusia, probably denoted from Andalusian Arabic, Berber, and various forms of Ibero-Romance. <clears throat> How much farther are we going? Almost gone to the conclusions. Probably not going to read the methods. No. Sorry, I lost my place. When the Khazar Empire lost its prominence and the Jewish monopoly on the Silk Road ended about the 11th century, the relaxification process was gradually abandoned. At that point, Slavic Yiddish became the first and only spoken and written language of the European Ashkenazic Jews. Iranian remained the language of the Central Asian and Iranian Ashkenazic Jews, and both groups continued to call themselves Ashkenazic up to the present, and began to absorb more German influence post relaxificationally. Consequently, Yiddish grammar and phonology are Slavic, with some Irano-Turkic input and only some of the lexicon is German. This process, however, was not accompanied by massive gene exchanges between Jews and non-Jews, likely due to the severe restrictions set on mixed marriages by the medieval Christian authorities. This is also consistent with the estimated dates of admixture in Ashkenazic Jewish genomes from 695 to 1215 A.D., if one examines the German and Hebrew component of contemporary Yiddish, one can still see the enormity of the Germanoid and Hebroid components in comparison to genuine Germanisms and Hebraisms. To take one example, Yiddish, Unterkofien, to bribe, has German components, under and to buy. The combination and meaning are impossible in all forms of German, past or present. Further evidence to the origin of Ashkenazic Jews can be found in the many customs and their names concerning the Jewish religion, which were probably introduced by Slavic converts to Judaism. For example, the Yiddish term treyvern, to remove the forbidden parts of the animal to render the meat kosher, is from Slavic. For example, Ukrainian terabiti means to peel, sh uh, to peel shell, or clean a field. The Yiddish meaning is obviously innovative. Another Ashkenazic custom of distinctly non-Jewish is the breaking of a glass at a wedding ceremony, uh, which is Slavic and Iranian. A striking fact that is hardly ever appreciated is that Yiddish kosher is not a Hebraism, as is widely believed. It appeared, appears centuries after the demise of colloquial Semitic Hebrew, but the source of the term is a common Iranian word, meaning to slaughter an animal. For example, oset kusart, kusart means animal slaughtered for food. Apparently, Yiddish speakers Hebroidized the Iranianism with the legitimate biblical Hebrew keser, which meant only fit or suitable, but had no connection to food. Many of the Arabic-speaking Jews to this day do not use the Hebrew Hebroid term at all. Our findings illuminate the historical processes that simulated the relaxification 
of Yiddish, one of over two dozen other languages that went through relexification like Esperanto, which is Yiddish relexified to Latinoid lexicon, some forms of contemporary Sorbian, which is German relexified to Sorbian lexicon, and Ukrainian and Belarusian, which is Russian relexified to Ukrainian and Belarusian lexicon. Limitations. Our study has several limitations. First, because our study is the first to analyze the genomes of Yiddish-speaking Ashkenazic Jews, a caution is warranted in interpreting some of our results due to the choice of data, method, and individuals. Second, DNA samples were genotyped on the genochip, which is relatively small in size and does not allow extensive IBD analyses. I'm going to skip through this part. Um, if you are interested in reading about the limitations of their study, that is included here. Uh, but then they get on to conclusions, a short little thing. So this is where we'll finish. Yes. Language is the atom of a community, the molecule that binds its history, culture, and behavior, and identity, and the compound that unites its geography and genetics. It is thereby not surprising that the origin of Ashkenazic Jews remains the most enigmatic and unexplored topics in history, since the linguistic approaches utilized to answer this question have thus far provided inconclusive results, we analyze the genomes of Yiddish and non-Yiddish-speaking Ashkenazic Jews in search for their geographical origins. We traced nearly all Ashkenazic Jews to major primeval trade routes in northeastern Turkey adjacent to primeval villages whose names may be derived from Ashkenaz. We conclude that Ashkenazic Jews probably originated during the first millennium when Iranian Jews, Judaized Greco-Roman, Turk, Iranian, Southern Caucasus, and Slavic populations inhabiting the lands of Ashkenaz in Turkey. Our findings imply that Yiddish was created by Slavo-Iranian Jewish merchants plying the Silk Roads between Germany, North Africa, and China. Thank you, Kat. So uh, that's the end of part two of this, uh, explaining the origins of Ashkenazic Jews and Yiddish. Uh, thanks to all these people who conducted the research, to Iran El Haik, who leads this stuff. And thank you for watching, for having an open mind, and not uh, freaking out too much about the controversy included in these findings. Thanks for watching.